All right, this is uh, as the volcano looked when it was starting to erupt down there in, in Chile when we were worshiping here on Sabbath morning. So this, uh, that's a little better picture of it, a little higher up. You can see the snow caps, so you know it's winter time and recent and a fairly new picture. Those clouds look pretty awesome, don't they? How about that one? Isn't that something? It's absolutely awesome. You know, we're going to find out that God is going to send some very exciting, terrific signs onto this world, other than just the darkening of the sun and the moon and a few stars falling here and there. He's got a lot more in store for us than that. This will be really an exciting adventure ahead of us. Doesn't that look like an atomic bomb setting off? Uh, a couple of birds look pretty dwarfed, don't they? <laughs> and those clouds are full of volcanic ash. It's got to drop out and fall someplace. Let's see, that's pretty much. This is the fallout of the ash. You can see it on the roof. On the, look at that car. It's just absolutely bathed in this stuff. You can't see anything of the yard. And uh, I don't know how much the rumbling caused the other damage. But here they are trying to shovel all that stuff up. Can you imagine how much shoveling they're going to have to do? I mean, look all around the yard. As far as you can see is this volcanic ash. What's it going to do to their farming community and whatnot for many, many years. Yeah. It'll not be the same in our lifetime, probably. That's not snow on the trees, folk. And that's not snow on the ground. That's all volcanic ash. When will they ever see their yards again? Look at this, just absolutely covered with ash. I guess it turned kind of dirty here for some reason or other, but you can see them scraping it off the roofs. Look at the cars. Poor little sheep, what are they going to do? They can't get through to their grass or anything. And you feel sorry for the little guys and gals. Or these guys, I mean, that's hardly a grassy meadow. And look at the color of the water and how far the ash goes out on it. There, how's that one? That would get you out of bed, wouldn't it? It's a huge fiery ball going up uh, high, high in the air. Look at this. You can see the twisting of the cloud as it goes up, the fire at the bottom of the volcano, and it's all uniting with a uh, lightning storm on top. It's absolutely amazing. You know, the Lord covered his people with a pillar of fire, didn't he? Yes, yes. wonder what it was like. These are just beautiful pictures. This was probably taken out the window of an airplane. Still see a few birds flying around. Actually, from a distance where you're safe, it's absolutely beautiful. But if you're sitting there wondering how far that hot ash is going to travel, <laughs> it's a different story. Look at that one. <clears throat> it's absolutely tremendous, the power of these things. Not only up, but the twist in it. Look at the twists going up into the sky. You know, if I was a, a rancher on a horse <laughs> getting my cows into the corral and I saw something like that, I think I'd get off my horse. <laughs> How's that for a firestorm? Wow. Didn't you talk about something like that with trumpets? Yeah, firestorm hitting the earth. 
Well, this is proof positive that it can sure happen. Now, what he's doing is emptying out a couple of shovels. He's been trying to get the uh, ash off his front porch. That's not snow. That's not snow. Can you see the pile in the background in front of the yellow one? It's just absolutely covered with ash. Now, this is actually in Argentina. It had to go over the Andes Mountains to land here. Anybody for a swim this morning? Isn't that horrible? I wonder what it does to the fish. I believe this is uh, looking toward a country club. Yeah, that's a golf course. Been nice and green. <laughs> I wonder when they'll see green again. Uh, some of it got pretty large. I had this picture in your newsletter. Wow. Several thousand feet up into the air and all that's taking place. Just absolutely awesome. Good morning. Wouldn't that wake you up? Well, according to the Word of God, we're going to see things much more grand than that in the near future. We'll look at that a little bit in the seals this morning. See the volcano going up, the ash spreading all over the uh, top of the slide with the thunder lightning shining through it. Absolutely powerful. That looks almost like a tornado, doesn't it? I wonder how wide that volcano is at the base and how high it actually went. A little closer view. It's about as close as I want to get. <laughs> Nothing you can do about it, just watch it blow. There's no way you're going to put a lid on that one. These people are nervous, they're afraid. I think I would be too. Yes. Tiptoeing through the volcanic ash. Huh? Isn't that a picture? Whew. All right, we're looking at the signs and the seals this morning. And I uh, was watching somebody else's DVDs on Revelation. And I should have brought the name to you. It would have been the courteous thing to do, but actually I've, the name has slipped my mind, and I apologize for that. But I used his work as an outline. He didn't come to all the conclusions that you're going to hear today. And some of the things you're going to read were not on his DVDs. But I did like his outline. It fit right into the ones we had together when I preached on uh, uh, the 144,000 uh, last time we were together. So uh, this fits right in with that, and I, I thought it was good, and I adopted it and made a little, few little changes to fit myself, and I uh, think you'll enjoy it. All right, I want to get into this ahead of time with a few thoughts that uh, might lay some things to rest. Because if the church knew these things, I think it would be studying and digging out a lot more things like uh, Chris was doing this last week. You know, digging, finding, deciding, what determines what, what is the end going to be? After you go through all of this, where did it lead to? And because all this is true, this is true, and, and we kind of know where we are. And we can't do that, folk, just studying uh, the love stories in the Bible all the time. Uh, not that they're not good and important, but there's more digging and research to do. And Ellen White says we must not think, well, we have all the truth. We understand the main pillars of our faith, and may, we may rest on this knowledge. I wish I could tell you the many times I come against that. 
That very thing. Some of you are shaking your heads. You've come against it too. The truth is an advancing truth. And we must walk in the increasing light. We must have living faith in our hearts and reach out for larger knowledge and more advanced light. Well, we haven't had much since 1915. Uh, we've had a rehash of the same things we've had until people are bored with it and they're going back to evangelical preaching because they're getting bored with the old stuff. They don't see it coming to pass anyway. So it's, it's kind of losing out. At least that's my philosophy. I don't blame them. I mean, if you holler wolf so many times, pretty soon nobody's going to believe there's a wolf, right? And we've said uh, the Lord's coming is, what's the word we use? Rather than immediate, it's something like that. Imminent. imminent. Yeah, the Lord's coming is imminent. Uh, we've said that now for 150 years. Well, what does imminent mean? Uh, right away. Yeah, well, but there were a lot of prophecies to be fulfilled in the meantime. We knew good and well it wasn't eminent. Uh, it was eminent in Ellen White's day, but 30 years after her death, he wasn't here yet. It lost being eminent. Uh, let, let's move on. I want to show, share you some other things because I want you to know that the pioneers were thinking as we should be thinking. I'm certainly not challenging the pioneers here. Don't get that idea. James White, it has been impossible to make some see that present truth is present truth and not future truth. See, he was smart enough to know that. Why aren't we? Present truth was present truth in their day, but present truth of 1900 is not present truth in 2000. It's truth. It's still truth. It's still good to build on, but it's not present truth. It was present 100 years ago. That's when it was present truth. And the word of the lamp shines brightly where we stand. Now we can understand these things now, but not so plainly in the distance. We don't understand everything about the distance yet. He left that for a distant generation to do. So I'm challenging you this morning. Do what the pioneers expected you to do. Look in the word of God. Look in the scriptures. Get the concepts the Holy Spirit's trying to bring out for you in this generation. And we'll move on. Perhaps we can stretch back to the late 1900s, but we're certainly not back to the late 1800s. That just tears what James said all out of position. <laughs> I'm sorry about the space in the middle. There are glorious truths to come before the people of God. Privileges and duties that our pioneers did not suspect to be in the Bible will be laid open before the followers of Christ. How many times I've heard that the pioneers didn't have it and Ellen White didn't have it, I don't want it. They put themselves completely out of harmony with both the pioneers and Ellen White saying that. We're to look for things they didn't even suspect was there. And these things have duties in them that we should be doing and privileges that we should be enjoying. And that's why some people here preach, let's get out of the box. They don't mean join some other organization. They mean enlarge your thinking. Review the scripture, seeing what it's saying to this generation. There will be a development of understanding. For the truth is capable of its constant expansion. Our, expl our explanation of truth is yet incomplete. Well, let's complete it. We're running out of time. We've gathered only a few rays of light. Friends, if all of our doctrines are only a few rays, there's got to be a lot more to come. But friends, how can we bring it to an organization that says we don't want it? It's, it th things are difficult. They're confusing today. But as real spiritual life declines, now that's what we don't want to happen. As real spiritual life declines, it has ever been the tendency to cease to advance in the knowledge of truth. When the spirituality goes down, advancement in truth stops. 
So if we have no advancement in truth, what's that saying about our spiritual tendencies, our spiritual life? It's telling us it's declined. It's declined. All right. M men rest. Now, get this. You've got to get this. This is so true. How could anyone 150 years ago speak something so true about us today? I don't know. Men rest satisfied with the light already received from God's word and discourage any further investigation of the scriptures. They become what? Conservative. conservative. Have you have ever tried to con convince a conservative of new truth? They're the hardest ones to touch. They've got it all, they know it all, and they don't want it anymore. You say the liberals might receive it. Yes, they might, but they're liberal. You know, you've got to watch out a little bit, but at least they have an opportunity to talk to a liberal. Discourage any further investigation of the Scriptures. They become conservative and seek to avoid discussion. A person brings a, a book with... Um, like new discoveries from old manuscripts to their pastor. Oh, this is interesting. Yes, I've heard about this. I'd, I, I'd, I'd like to see it. A couple of weeks later, well, have you seen it? Well, no, I really haven't had time to look at it yet, but I will. Uh, have you read the book yet, two or three weeks later? Uh, yeah, I skimmed through it. Well, what did you think about it? Um, it's interesting, but don't get too involved. We already know the answers to these things. And if you push any further, pretty soon you're on the outside of his parameters. You see, they don't really want to discuss the issues as we see them. They want to discuss, discuss the issues as they see them. They forget that we've already seen the issues as they see them because those are the issues we once believed. It's time for them to look at new issues. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, I saw that God had children who not see and keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected the light upon it and at the commencement of the time of trouble, that's what we're getting into in the, today's lecture. The commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more, what? Fully. Now that means more to you than it does to the average church member. Uh, they read that to mean more extensively. It's just going to go everywhere. But that's not what more fully means. You're going to full, more fully understand the Sabbath and that's the way you're going to preach it. And... Uh, we were filled with the Holy Ghost. That's important. When were we filled with the Holy Ghost? At the commencement of the time of trouble. This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refuse the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth, and they came out and endured the persecution with us. I saw sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion. Remember that sequence. Sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments upon them. <laughs> and they rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. In the time of trouble, we all fled from the cities and villages, but were pursued by the wicked. We were pursued by the wicked carrying their swords. That's early writings, page 33. At the commencement of the time of trouble, we're out preaching the truth. At the end of the time of trouble, we're running for our lives. The difference is probation's closed by the end of it. The commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out. Our pioneers thought that it did. They thought the seven last plagues were the time of trouble. The wrath of God is filled in the seven last plagues. They didn't realize there was more to the wrath of God than that. And so the seven last plagues, our pioneers thought, was the time of trouble. It is a time of trouble. Part of it. 
The commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. Ever wondered why we're not all out in a big third world war yet? At that time, the latter rain of refreshing the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period of the great time of trouble, <laughs> that is, when the plagues, seven last plagues, shall be poured out. So w this indicates that without the power of the Holy Spirit, we would have trouble standing for our faith even during the seven last plagues after the close of probation. So things are going to become very horrendous on planet Earth. Time to prepare is today. Well, I like this sequence. I think it's about as close to right as anybody's, and I've seen several different ones. There's the early time of trouble that begins softly and builds. Then there's a great time of trouble, which include the trumpets and the plagues. Now, if you're here when I talked about the 144,000 and their ceiling this last time, if you weren't, well, I try to get the DVD from Sandy. Uh, you'll see that why the trumpets show up right after the ceiling of the 144,000. Then finally, the seven last plagues when there is no mercy. Salvation is over with. Probation is closed on the world. And that includes the trumpets, the plagues, the great time of trouble as I see it. Our interest today is the early time of trouble, because that's what we're getting into, if we aren't already. Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Therefore, if we want to know more about the early time of trouble, we have to look at the prophets to find it. Has it been revealed when to expect the first trumpet? What do we know about the early time of trouble? What starts it? Well, what ends it? All right. Christ said something about all these are the beginning of sorrows when he talks about the signs we talked about not too long ago. If you don't have that one, it's very inexpensive. What do we call it? Our time of trouble? Something like that. I need Sandy's help here. Anyways. All these, I'll, I'll, I'll remember it before it's over. All these are the beginning of sorrows, Matthew said. All what? Once labor begins, you know there's no more pain ahead. There is more pain ahead. Once it starts, it's going to get worse. And the Lord likens the little time of trouble <clears throat> to the birth pains. Start kind of light at first, and then they get stronger and stronger and stronger. Once the pangs start, there's no turning back. Uh-oh, got to go through with this. Oh, I'd like to go back home and quit it for a while. <laughs> Not a chance in the world. Once the birth pangs of the last eight events begin, they're not going to go back. They're going to keep going. After it's over, there are no regrets. Because there's a physical new birth. And after our birth pangs are all over and the end comes, <laughs> we're going to have brand new bodies. And I look forward to that. What are the beginning of sorrows from which there is no turning back until it's over and we receive our new bodies? What is all this anyway? <clears throat> all right, Matthew 24 tells us there'll be deceptions, Nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Wars. Haven't there always been? Famines, earthquakes, pestilences. Haven't there always been? How do we know that when the last set is going to start? And tribulation. And then there are signs in heaven. A nation against nation and kingdom and kingdom against kingdom. I'm going to shorten that and say wars. Is that all right with everybody? You'll know what I'm talking about. 
Now Luke 21 tells us the same things, deception, wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, tribulation, fearful sights, signs in the heavens. I looked up the word fearful and strongs and it said terrific, frightening, terrifically frightening. We saw some signs earlier, didn't we, today? And if that sign like that appeared out here about 10 miles from this place, it would be terrifically frightening. But when they happen around the world in various places, everyone will take notice, of course. Early time of trouble. Then we get into trumpets and plagues. All right, let's move on. The first six seals are in Revelation 6. The seventh seal is in Revelation 8. That's just for your information. For now, I'll ask your patience as we skip the first seal and start with the second one. We'll come back to the first one later. All right, seal number two, the red horse. The red horse takes peace from the earth and has men slaying one another. What does that sound like to you? Make sense? Isn't that what Christ said there'd be? All right. Let's move on a little bit. Seal number three. The black horse. He has balances for measuring items for sale. And we make all kinds of other things out of these balances. But really, basically, bottom line, how much wheat and how much barley and how much money to get for it. A measure of wheat for a, should be a penny. I don't know where my penny went. <laughs> Three measures of barley for a penny. All right. The black horse. What is this talking about? Our Lord said in Matthew 22, who also presented the seals to John to write down, we're talking about the same author here, says that a penny equaled a day's wages. Now if it took a day's wages to buy a measure of wheat or three measures of barley, how much wheat and barley could you buy at the end of the week? You'd spend your whole wage just for enough barley and wheat to barely survive on. So what is this looking like? Inflation. Takes everything you have to get what you need. The pr Why is the price high? Because the wages are low. <laughs> when the wages are low, any price is high. So we have an inflation thing here, and that leads to other things. What made food expensive? Shortage, which goes in hand with famine. If you don't have enough food, what have you got? Famine. That's right. Seal number four is a pale horse. Death and Hades follows this horse and rider. He talks of war and hunger affecting one-fourth of the earth. So we're looking in times when the whole world is known to the population. We know when there are floods in China. We know when there's a big earthquake in, in uh, Indonesia. We know when a volcano goes off in Chile. I mean, we're a world family now, and we pretty well know what's going on. And hunger is going to affect one-fourth of the earth. I can see it coming. I can see the weather patterns bringing it about. I can see thousands of acres that were planted last year that aren't planted this year. And not only in America. I can see fires. I can see uh, crops that we did have burned up. Millions of acres. I can see all these things going on. In the setting of these birth pangs, there's going to be a hunger on at least a fourth of the people of the earth. <clears throat> War and hunger. Does that sound anything like what Christ talked about? Matthew 24 and Luke 21? You see, 
People say, oh, if this is going on, why didn't it show up in the Revelation? It does show up in Revelation. In just about the same sequence, too. And about the same time setting. War, death, famine, equals death, disease, pestilence, it's going to be hell on earth. All of these things zero in on the earth. The horses <laughs> zero in on earth problems. After that, we start looking at problems in the heavens. And we see no more horses. There are seven seals, but only four horses. Yeah, I'm sure you've noticed that. Seal number five, no horse. There we are. Seen as in judgment in heaven. Judgment in favor of past martyrs. Prophecy from heaven. I should have my Bible here. We should read that. All right, we're going to look in Revelation chapter 6. I learned something early in my evangelism that I had to get over. Everybody likes their own Bible, right? You know where to find things, you know where things are, you even know where they are on the page. Uh, but in evangelism, when I went to people's homes to review the scriptures or the things they were learning, I use their Bible. Do you have a Bible in the house? Yes. Well, let's, let, let's look and see here. And I teach them from their Bible. Why did I do that? Why didn't I teach them out of mine? Yeah, this, this is my word of God I'm hearing. All right, we're looking at the sixth seal. Uh, fifth seal, I'm sorry. It's in verse 9 of chapter 6. You're probably there before I am. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw this under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, martyrs, and for the testimony which they held. These people died for their faith. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, true and holy, or holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on the earth dwellers? Wow. Uh, can souls, uh, are there really souls under altars? <laughs> I don't think so. This is built up to teach us something. Uh, can the dead cry to the Lord? I don't think so. But Abel's blood did, didn't it? Abel's blood cried out to God. God said, I hear the blood of Abel. And what was he meaning by that? He recognized that Cain had killed Abel and he knew the whole story. That's what he was saying. All right. These are the dead who have been martyred. And verse 11, white robes were given to every one of them. That's an indication that the judgment of the past martyrs is over. Can I say the judgment of the dead? They have their white robes. Doesn't mean they're running around in them yet, and I'll prove that to you. And it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season. What does that mean? It means they have to de stay dead a while longer. Their judgment's over. Their white robe is secured. But they can't take it yet. They don't have it yet. When will they get it? Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. The martyrs of the past... They may, the judgment of the dead may be over, and they're certainly a part of that, and white robes secured, but they cannot enter the kingdom of God until the last martyrs on earth pay their dues. You ready to be one of those who've called upon? Do you love Yeshua to the extent that you would die for him as he died for you? Do you share that much love for God and for one another? Would you rather die than turn people against me? Would I rather die than tell them where to find you? See, how much love are we gaining for one another as we study the scriptures and worship together on his Sabbath? Okay, so, that, so much for seal number five. But there's no horse. Where's the scene? The main scene is up in heaven where the judgment's going on. 
Judgment in favor of the past martyrs, prophecy from heaven of future martyrs that haven't happened on earth yet. So, we have persecution. Did Christ talk about persecution in Matthew 24 and Luke 21? Yes, he certainly did. That's why we went over those things on the list earlier. All right. See also Revelation 20, verse 4. Then I'll get, get off this subject. Because eventually, after we get through the seals, we get into the trumpets, after the trumpets, the plagues, and after the plagues, Christ comes, and we have an eternal rest with God forever. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. And we're going to be faithful between now and then. Amen. We're going to support one another. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to be the kind of God, people that God expects us to be, the type the angels are looking for, and he's going to set his seal of approval on us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. 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 All right. Don't lose sight of that. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, in favor of them, really. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for a witness of Jesus for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Who was he looking at? He was looking at those future martyrs that we saw under the fifth seal. Those martyrs that will be martyred because they are faithful in spite of the mark of the beast situation. So we're getting right down to the close of events here. All right, let's move on. No horse, six seal. There's a great earthquake, and that earthquake shakes everything and causes everybody to look up. Why? Because they're going to see signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and, and the stars floating all across the sky in one direction. Now, what would cause all the stars to go across the sky in one direction? Yeah, the earth rotating. If the earth goes out of its axis or rotates like this, what does it make all the stars do? Right. But it's going to look, we're going to look up in the heavens and these things are going to be terrifying. The Bible says terrifying signs such as seeing the heavens departing unnaturally. You look up and you see all this going on and all of a sudden it just looks like it's ripping apart. And you're, What are you going to do? You're going to run and try to hide from it or whatever unless you know what's going on why it's going on, what the end is going to be, what part you have played in it, and what Christ is about to do for you. When you have all these answers up here, you can let it rip. Great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That's what God says. You've read that text many times, haven't you? You can have that peace, brothers and sisters, but you can only have it if you're real with God. So we have signs in heaven. Is that what we had in Matthew 24 and Luke 21? Same thing. He's just putting it down to where we can see it in a last day setting. People are hiding from these things. They're frightening heavenly terrors. And, and, and they're saying, who shall be able to stand? Terrible. I've heard a lot of answers about that. Who shall be able to stand? All these things are going on and they're horrific. And the world is scared to death. And God's people are being persecuted. But they're still present those that are alive are still presenting truth. And uh, all of these happening until the close of probation. And we see all these horrendous things happening. And the earth pounding with earthquakes and all the rest of it. And the people are saying, who shall be able to stand? Which takes us into the lecture we had last. The 144,000 and the great multitude they will stand against the wiles of the devil. And that group, the great multitude, many of them came through great tribulation, the Bible says. And if they come through great tribulation, that means many of them give their lives. Those future martyrs. They may be the converts of the 144,000. Will you feel guilty? Will you feel guilty for converting them if you see them taken to prison? Or will you rejoice and say, there's a saint that's going to glory and this is all going to be over with very shortly. You see, these things are given to us to let us know that we're, hey, things are happening quick. The last day events will be what kind? Rapid ones. God is soon to come to raise the dead. Don't worry about it. 
Job's had to wait a long time. <laughs> These martyrs want hard, wait hardly any time at all. Wow. Who shall be able to stand? Remember, the question's answered in the very next chapter. The 144,000 and the great multitude who passed through the great tribulation. All right. Are we together so far? If anybody ever asks you, why doesn't the John the Revelator talk about the same things Christ did in relation to the preparation for the trumpets? You can say, he did. He just called it seals. The seventh seal is the silence in heaven and the casting of the fire followed by the seven trumpets. So that brings us down pretty close to the end. So in review... Of the Gospels, we see the wars, we see the earthquakes, we see famines, pestilence, tribulation, fearful sights, and signs from the heavens. They grow. The seals, we see wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, tri tribulation, fearful sights, and signs in the heavens. We see exactly the same thing. Only the more details are there, so go read them. <laughs> Matthew 24. A sequence problem. I'm going to try to help you out with it the best I can. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See, they be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in different places. Boy, has that ever come to pass. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. So when you see all these things, know that your tribulation is getting close. Or know that your time of witness is getting close. Because it's in tribulation that God's people are purified and their witness is given. But Luke 10 puts it a little different. Luke 21. Then said he unto them, the he being Christ, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilence, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you. Well, in Matthew, the persecution came after all those signs. In Luke, it looks like it comes before all those signs. Can you see that difference? But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. So that... Just exactly the opposite of what it's recorded in Matthew. So I looked at it very closely. And I think in punctuation, the translator saw something and they didn't quite know how to put it. Now you don't have to follow me with this too closely, but you can if you want. You see that little uh, comma there? There shall be great earthquakes shall be in divers places, comma, and famines, comma, and pestilences, semicolon, and fearful sights and great signs. Well, why isn't there a comma there? I mean, it's going on in the same sequence, isn't it? Well, maybe not. Maybe before all these refers to these following the semicolon. The fearful sights and great signs shall be from heaven. If that's the case, it agrees perfectly with Matthew. So that's how I look at it. You may have another way, that's okay. But that, that's how I look at it because it agrees completely with what Matthew had to say and the seals. All right, let's move on. Apparently these signs will continue on through the trumpets into the plagues and to the end of time getting more violent as the world continues to thumb its nose at the king of the universe, his government, his saints, and his laws. The more of that that's going on, even though Satan has them psyched up to think they're doing right, the Bible says they're doing wrong. I think the devil convinced Eve she was doing right for herself. But she went exactly against what God said. And that's a problem. All right. So we have the early time of trouble and the great time of trouble. Now let's see. Most of these signs have been seen in previous generations. I could give you a list of them that claim to have seen these same signs in their age. As an example, one you know would be 1844. 
So how can we know that this is the time that these signs, these birth pangs, will start and culminate in the sealing of the 144,000, the beginning of trumpets? The sixth seal warns or informs us that that day of his wrath is coming up. Wow, what are we going to do? The answer may be in the first seal. I left it aside, didn't I? We didn't look at the first seal. Okay, let's look at the first seal. That won't take a bit of time. The first seal, Revelation 6, 1. A white horse. Purity. Holy Church. A bow. Onward Christian soldiers. A crown. The king priest presides. He's in the saddle. Conquering happened in the day of Pentecost. Paul says every creature under heaven heard the message of truth. Is that going to happen again? Is the truth going worldwide? And this gospel should be preached where? In all the world and then what? The end shall come. All right. So how are we going to be able to do that? We're going to be able to do that because of the white horse and its rider. All right, let's take a look at this. This has been interpreted to be the experience of the apostolic church when they had the power of the Holy Spirit to go forward with their message. But you've studied in the past that very often a message comes before the power to work miracles comes. And you see that in Scripture, and it certainly makes sense. If you haven't seen it, read the book New Discoveries from Old Manuscripts. It certainly makes sense, because how would we know what to preach about if we didn't have a message to preach first? So all these things that the pioneers didn't have, that Ellen White said would be coming later, these people are going to have. And they will endowed with the power to present it. Let's go on. Seventh-day Adventists have generally held, this is a quote, that the first ho horse represents the church in the apostolic age. You can read that in your own volume 7 of the commentary. So what do we have in connection with all of these signs that the people of past generations didn't have? About 1888 they were getting it, but they blew it. What's going on here? Listen. I'm so glad we have Ellen White. You know, people keep throwing tomatoes at her from all directions. But you really read what she said. It always makes sense. Amen. Did she make a mistake? Probably. I don't know of a human that didn't, including the prophets. But still, tremendous guidance, tremendous help. Now listen to this. In his parting conversation with the disciples on the night before the crucifixion, the Savior made no reference to the sufferings that he had endured, nor must yet endure. He did not speak of the humiliation that was before him, but sought to bring to their minds that which would strengthen their faith, leading them to look forward to the joys that await the overcomer. He rejoiced in the consciousness that he could and would do more from his followers through the Comforter, than he had promised, that from him would flow forth love and compassion, cleansing the soul temple, making men like him in character, that his truth, armed with the power of the Spirit, would go forth conquering and to conquer. Isn't that the white horse? Yes. It's exactly the white horse. That's what's beginning to happen now. That's what's starting. That's why you're here, because you sense it. You know it. Some of you may just be finding out. It's all right. Keep studying. Keep learning. Armed with the power of God's Spirit, presenting the truth, cleansing soul temples, making men like Him in His character. What made the difference? What made it possible? Pentecost, the comforter, the rider on the white horse. So, Let's put our signs in perspective. They don't necessarily need to follow one in order. They're all there. The first is the evidence of the Spirit of God working with His people, giving them that that they have not gotten yet. 
preparing them for their final work on earth. When is that supposed to happen? During the deceptions, the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the pestilence, and finally the coming into the tribulation and all the signs from heaven. These are all a part of it. And every part has to be there. Same things in Luke, of course. All right? History will be repeated, as Ellen White said so many times. What evidence proves the Spirit of God is working now at the same time the present signs such as floods, winds, wars, earthquakes, fires, pestilence, etc. are happening globally? Is the white horse moving? Is the Spirit preparing us for coming events? Will He prepare billions of people on the earth? Will He prepare, prepare millions? Or will He find 144,000? A relatively small group. Or maybe that's symbolic. Still a small group by comparison. Let's take a look. The captain guides his horse. That stumbling blocks which has hindered the progress of truth may be removed. And God have a clean and holy people. White horse? To declare his statutes and judgments. The captain. He's in the saddle of our salvation, leads his people on step by step, purifying and fitting them for translation. Amen. White horse. White horse. The word declares, pure church, no Babylon in them. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This, Ellen White says, is the descent of the Holy Spirit sent from God to do its office work. What is it? The Holy Spirit, the white horse, is going to do what? Present a people to declare his statutes and judgments. Is that happening on earth right now? Amen. Is it happening only in this denomination? No. It's happening with small groups globally. I had a friend from Church of God Seventh Day here. His mind slipped. My, his name slipped my mind. Some of you help me out. Tom Robertson. Tom Robertson. Roberts. Tom Roberts. Yes. And he told us of all the denominations we're finding the feast, and of course now worshiping on the Seventh Day Sabbath, all around the world. He named them. He showed pictures and everything, and they're coming to this knowledge. What's causing that? What's happening? Yeah the white horse is starting to rumble. And you're a part of it. Amen. Praise God that you've been sought out. Praise God that you're willing to listen. While the birth paying signs are shining, the white horse is descending from heaven. The people are responding to the final call to remember the law of Moses was the statutes and judgments. The last call to God's people on this earth is given in Malachi 4.4. Today, the true Spirit of God is transcending denominational barriers until thousands have responded. Who should have been the leader in it all? Well, friends, we're not to be the tail. We're supposed to be the leaders. There are plenty of signs in the physical world. There are plenty of signs in the spiritual world as well. You being here this morning is one of them. I'm so glad you're not someplace else. And I pray all the empty seats are filled with angels. Amen. Amen. Let's move on. Review and Herald 12, 18, 1894. The Lord Jesus gave these commandments from the pillar of cloud. And Moses repeated them to the children of Israel and wrote them in a book. Oh, how many times I preached that that book of the law was nailed to the cross. But Ellen White came to the rescue. I read the whole verse. 
that they might not depart from righteousness. They wrote them in a book that they might not depart from righteousness. Are God's 144,000 going to ever depart from righteousness? No. How are they going to know the difference? <laughs> Just like she says. We are under obligation to fulfill these specifications for in so doing we fulfill the specifications of the law of God. God is going to have a holy, righteous, clean, pure, white horse going across this world. And the further we get into the signs we see, the more we're going to get into the signs we have not yet seen. But all the while the Holy Spirit is calling people to make changes in their lives, to follow Him closer. Early Writings, page 33. At the commencement of the time of trouble. <laughs> we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more extensively. Is that what it says? No, it says more fully. If you take a check into Patriarchs and Prophets 3.10, you'll find out what full, more fully means. But I'm going to leave you with that. <clears throat> So here we are, evidence of the Spirit of God doing His work on the earth, changes being made in lives and hearts, things like this going on that have otherwise no reason to be going on. <sighs> Wouldn't Claire and I love to just retire and sit in a hammock and suck lemonade? <laughs> you ought to see us around here. We don't even hardly, hardly have time for one another. There's so much to do. But their deceptions are going on, nations against nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilence, tribulation, and so on. The same as the seals. And where are we in it? Different from any other generation that saw all these same signs. And how often you see that, oh, there's always been earthquakes. And there's always been this. There's always been that. Yes, but has it all come in a bunch like it's coming now? early time of trouble. We're soon to get into the trumpets. And that's all I have to present to you this morning. Did you enjoy yourself? Amen. Do you feel challenged to be one of God's children? Amen. I want you to give your lives to Christ in a special sense this morning. I want this trip that you made to come all the way out here in the sticks <laughs> to worship with a few like believers and those who are not afraid to get in to study and learn some things. I want you to be glad you came. So if you'd like to kneel with me in a prayer of consecration, we'll have that now at the end of the service. And then we do have a special prayer. I don't want to cheat somebody out of doing that. Who's Jack King? Right here in the front row. Would you lead us in this prayer of dedication? Thank you, Jack. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're very grateful this morning that for this message that we've heard, and we're thankful that this ministry is keeping these truths alive. Now, Heavenly Father, when we hear the great events of the future, we feel weak, and we feel like backing away instead of going forward. We know, Heavenly Father, that we, we need your strength. We need the Holy Spirit with us as we look forward to the events that have been described today. And we ask, Lord, that as we study and understand these prophecies, that we will not think about how severe the tribulations will be and the difficulties but rather we'll think of how great the victory will be with your power. Amen. Amen. Now, Heavenly Father, may we remember what we have heard today and may we continue to build on that in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.